everybody. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to have Nick from Intuitive Tennis on the podcast. Uh, he's someone who I've been watching on YouTube quite a bit, quite frequently, and uh, just uh, top quality uh, stuff. I was actually talking to uh, to my friend the other day at a board meeting, and I had mentioned that, that I'd be interviewing you. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, I love uh, Nick's video. So, uh, Nick, it's really nice to get you on the, the show. And, uh, yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, anytime. I know you're you're a busy man, Nick. So uh, it's his pleasure. So uh, I thought this might be a neat question. Uh, hopefully, is uh, I wanted to ask you first off is what does um, intuitive tennis you know, mean to you? Like, wh why did you end up picking that name? And then maybe is that you know part of the philosophy as well? Yeah, it's definitely part of the methodology. So. I started the YouTube channel in 2018, but I developed my teaching methodology way before that. I did a tremendous amount of research probably five to 10 years prior to starting the YouTube channel. And to simplify it, like the thesis of all my research and the result of all the research that I collected was the fact that tennis in essence is an intuitive game and that's why i called it intuitive tennis now, of course it gets very complex but if you want to simplify things you, you can call tennis an intuitive game um, so that's really the reason behind the name i think it, it fits perfectly uh, into what i teach to my students yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I don't know if I'm getting the <laughs> definition right or not, but like, I feel like when I'm on the court, sometimes I just like, for, like you know, last second adjustment things, things like that. You know, it's just like kind of intuitive the way things w work out. Um, you know, what's right. So uh, I really like the name there. And um, in terms of uh, you know getting started playing tennis, I think that that seems to be like a cool uh, discovery for for you know when I uh, interview my guests. So like, how did you actually get your start uh, in the game? Well, my dad was a coach in Split Croatia. So I grew up in mm -hmm. Split Croatia and we, our house was right next to the tennis club Split, which was a legendary tennis club. And there are so many legendary players that came out of that one club. I can name a few that you're going to know for sure. Goran Ivanisevic, wow. Mario Ancic, Nikki mm -hmm. Pilic, um, all top 10 players. And there's a lot more that came out of that club. And that's where my dad was the head coach. And you would think that I would be obsessed with tennis because I could literally just walk over the street and get to the courts. But when I lived in Croatia, I did not care about tennis at all. <laughs> it was at nine years old when my dad moved our family to Germany. That is when I became uh, interested in tennis. Uh, it was a situation where I came to Germany without knowing the language. So tennis was a good outlet for me to meet other kids. And that's where I started spending every afternoon after school at the tennis club. I would just hang out at the tennis club all day. And um, I wouldn't say I was obsessed with it right off the bat because I wasn't very good in the beginning. I did play a little bit of tennis in split Croatia, but it wasn't serious. And then when I came to Germany at nine, I started playing a lot more, but I, I wasn't very good. Okay. I wasn't winning the club championships, anything like that, but I played every day. Mm. And after about two years, when I was like 11, 12, that's when things started kicking in and I started playing a lot better and I started winning the club championships. And then at 13, I started winning, um, national tournaments in germany i started like becoming really good so that's where the tennis obsession began i would think i think around 11 12 is when i became more obsessed with it because i got good at it and yeah ever since then it hasn't really stopped i've been completely obsessed with tennis um yeah ever since that moment and what what made you you know good all of a sudden like what changed was it uh, did you start taking lessons or like just like mindset wise or what happened there that's a great question um well i didn't have to take lessons because my dad was a coach so i had a, oh, right, I, had right. free, I had free lessons you know yeah, this is right. always a great advantage when uh yeah 
your dad or your mom can be your coach and you get the lessons for free. So my dad was my coach. And look, I'm not, and I don't mind admitting this, but I'm not a very talented tennis player. And I'm not very athletically gifted. I heard Rick Macy once say that he has never seen a player who played at the elite level, you know, the players that we see on TV, who hasn't had an athletic background somewhere in the genetic line. It means either the mom and the dad played sport at the high level, or it doesn't have to be mom and dad, could be the grandparents, could be uncles, somewhere in the genetics, there was some great athleticism there. Where in my case, even though my dad was a decent player, not a professional level player by any means, I don't have the greatest genes for tennis. Now, people will often say, Nick, what are you talking about? You're like perfect height for tennis. You're 6'5", but I'm not very coordinated. And naturally, I'm more slow. So for me, uh, it was all about hard work because you don't need to be the most athletically gifted person to be good at tennis. You probably do need that uh, to make it to the very, very top. That's completely different. To be, but to become a good tennis player, hard work will take you very far. And that's exactly what I did. It was hard work. And then I don't know what happened. Um, maybe a combination of all the hard work and matches that it just kind of clicked. And I remember this vividly. There was a this is a great friend of mine. I don't mind shouting him out. He played for Cornell, um, mm. Stefan Pavlovich. He was a lefty and he was like the king of the club back in those days. And I, he would beat me like in the first couple of times that I played in the club championships. It's like in the 10 and under and the 12 and under. So I lost to him 0 and 0. And then I think I was 11 or 12 is the first time I beat him. And it was 6 4 in the third. And I remember this match because there was a ton of people there. Tennis in, in those days in Germany was booming. You can't even imagine. There was probably like 100 people watching that wow. uh, club, cha club championship match. The tennis was unbelievably popular back then in Germany. So, um, so this would be like late 80s, I guess. Yeah, mid to late 80s. So this after Becker won his first to Wimbledon, so Steffi Graf. Tennis was crazy back then in Germany. Um, and yeah, so this is, this is when everything kind of flipped around. I, yeah, I won that one match and then you know how it is when you start playing better, your confidence builds and you just want to keep working harder and harder. And then from that moment on, I just kept playing better and better. Of course, there was also a growth spurt. You know, I, uh, I got really tall and I started developing um, a good serve for my age because my dad, you know, he coached Ivan Nishevich when Ivan Nishevich was... Um, wow between 10 and 13 years old. Um, and my dad put a huge emphasis on serving because there's a lot of great servers that come from Croatia. You talk about Niki Pilic, Ivan Nishevic, Ivan Ljubic, Ivo Karlovic, a lot of great servers from Croatia. So my dad put a huge emphasis on that and I started developing a good serve. And um, despite my lack of athleticism, I, I was a very consistent baseliner. I never really came to the net that much, but I was a very consistent baseliner and a fighter. I jokingly call myself the poor man's John Isner, you know, <laughs> nowhere near John Isner's level, but kind of like that type of game, you know, big serve, but then don't really come to the net that much and just kind of grind it out for the baseline with powerful ground strokes, consistent yeah. ground strokes. So it just uh, slowly started getting better and better, but, you know, there's really... There's really no specific thing to pinpoint why I suddenly became good other than just the hard work and the everyday training, the hours every day on the court. I think that's, that's the secret formula. It's just going out there and, and training in a good way, in a productive way, as often as possible. This will produce results. I think people often look for like the, the magic formula, some kind of shortcut or anything like that, but yeah. I don't really believe in that. You know, you... Take whatever you were given athletically and just work your butt off and then you'll get better. So that's what happened to me. And then, you know, if I want to like, you know, talk about my junior career, I was 
getting really good at one point. Okay. I was like at 16. That year was probably my chance to do something big in tennis because I played really well. I, I won a ton of tournaments in Germany. I, I guess you can call them now ITF tournaments. I was doing, I played one of those. I made it to the semis. And Raymond Sluter, I don't know if you remember him, two hundred four, and he won that tournament. So that year, my dad, through his connections, organized for me to go to the United States and play like all the big junior tournaments in the United States, you know, like um, mm -hmm. Orange Bowl and Eddie Hearn, yeah. all that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know what happened, but I, I got um, uh, appendix surgery like the week before I was supposed to fly out of there. Uh. And that was a big setback because I was really doing well that year. So I feel like that year I was, I think, number 17 in Germany. Um, if I would have gone to the U.S. and got more experience, got more confidence playing like some of the big junior tournaments, um, maybe that would have propelled me to go further because I feel like after that surgery, I mean, I did get better a little bit, but it wasn't as explosive of an improvement as I had from like 13 to the 16. And, um, yeah, so it's just one of those things. I feel like that was a kind of a key moment there, um, around that age where I maybe could have been better than ended up being. And also that year, my dad tried to send me to the Nikki Pillage Academy in Munich and I refused to go. And I think that was a big mistake too, where if I would have gone down there, I would have um, been exposed to like the best players in Europe um, who would have been kicking my butt. And I think I would have gotten better where I kind of stayed in this um, small town in Germany that had good players, but uh, I was like the best player in the club and one of the best players in the whole state. So there wasn't, hmm. I mean, there was competition, but I feel like yeah, that was a mistake as well that I'd never ended up going. Um, to the Nikki Pillage Academy. And another problem was that um, when I moved to, when we moved to Germany at nine, we had Croatian passports. Um, mm -hmm. We never got the German citizenship. So I didn't play tennis in Croatia though. So I played tennis in Germany. So I never really got any help from the German Federation because I wasn't German. I was Croatian. And I also couldn't get any help from the Croatian Federation because I played tennis in Germany. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of another thing that, um, wasn't helpful and my dad had to like he had to jump through hoops to get anything going as far as like get some you know wild cards or getting into some of those those big tournaments so that that was that and then um i started focusing heavily um on playing adult tennis um probably around 16 it was very early i started playing a mm -hmm. lot of adult tennis at 16 uh, very early and i started playing um the club matches so this is what was probably my biggest focus then was um, playing in the club system in Germany and advancing mm -hmm. in the club system. And I did make it pretty, pretty high. Um, in that regard, I played, um, second Bundesliga for Dortmund and, um, cool. I played for some other clubs that were very high. So that was my big focus. And I did that and kind of building my German ranking. Um, I also was teaching lessons from a very young age. I started teaching lessons for my dad at the age of 13 and that in a big way also kind of held back um, my playing because I kind of liked, um, you know, the money from the lessons and I kind of enjoyed giving lessons. And um, I had a schedule, you know, I had some lessons during the weekend and I would play either club matches or prize money matches on the weekend. And then some of my friends uh, that were at a similar level as me would go off and play future. So they would travel and play satellites back then and stuff like that. And I never did that because I didn't want to leave. I was very comfortable mm -hmm. in, my, in my setup. Um, sure. So while that's probably a mistake, you know, as far as my playing, that probably hurt me a little bit that I didn't play future because I would have benefited greatly from that, would have probably improved my level. I am very grateful that I did teach and that I gathered so much experience teaching from a young age. I'm very thankful to my dad for that because what happens with a lot of um, players who turn into coaches is that they don't give any lessons. They're, they don't do any coaching apart maybe from some super high level coaching on tour or something like that. And then they get into the junior system or the club system and 
they're maybe in their late 20s or early 30s and they've never given a lesson in their life and they simply lack experience. So I'm very thankful for the fact that I did give lessons very young because that's made me a much better coach, a more experienced coach. Um, while this might have come at an expense uh, for my playing. Yeah, no, it's uh, it definitely, you know, it's a journey uh, always. And uh, you kind of reminded me of some some things that I did also where I wanted to stay in my comfort zone. Like I remember there was yes. like a, a, a tryout for um, this club JTCC near us, which is produced like Kudla and TFO and whatnot. And it was like right when they were starting and they invited, you know, some of the hire juniors to try out and stuff. And I was just, for whatever reason, I was like kind of scared about it. And so I didn't go. And then I was, I was repenting. This in Washington? Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Maryland. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And you play in college, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we have something in common, which, uh, it's not the greatest thing, but so obviously I was doing some research on you Nick before the interview. Mm -hmm. And so, so, uh, I played at UMBC and we, unfortunately they cut our tennis teams in 2015. And what's that stand for? Oh, uh, Sorry, University of Maryland. Oh, all good. University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, is that like, D one? Yeah, D one. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were in the America East Conference at the time. I'm not sure if you're familiar. It's just, you know. Is that where um, Scott played from Player Court? Uh, no, I don't think he played. No, he didn't play at UMBC. I'm trying to remember okay. where he because I thought he played somewhere D one out east. And anyway, yeah. never mind. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no you're good. Yeah. I know what you're getting at. Like uh, they cut, yeah. um, they cut uh, the Murray State. Yeah. That's where I play college yeah. tennis. They cut the men's tennis program, yeah. and it's very sad. But it's um, part of the Title IX thing, where yeah, you know they it comes at the expense of men's soccer, men's volleyball, and men's tennis usually, and it's because mm-hmm. of men's football taking away 52 scholarships per school that they want to make it more fair. And I do agree with that. You do want to have equality, but it's just unfortunate that tennis is one of those sports that's not important enough to be kept safe, but it often uh, gets cut, especially at at smaller programs. And um, see, Murray State is actually a very historic a tennis program with some big names. Uh, Benny Purcell, who was Mel Purcell's mm-hmm. dad, mm-hmm. he made the um, semifinals of the NCAA championship, I think, a few times um, with the Murray State men's tennis team that won the Ohio Valley Conference championship, I don't know, at least 10 times. And Mel Purcell, his son, who played on tour, he was a quarterfinalist in Wimbledon, he was ranked 20 in the world. He was my coach and he took over as the head coach. And while I was there, we won the Ohio Valley Conference Championship two times. And um, those are some of the best memories that I've had. And so it's, uh, his, it's not like the program was complete garbage and they cut it. It was a historic, immense program with some great results. And it's, it's a big shame. I'm very sad about that, but there's not much yeah. you can do, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And the strange thing with our program um, was that they cut both men's and women's and they talked about Title IX. And even stranger is that we didn't have a football team. So I, I really thought that we'd be a safe program, but I, I don't know what happened. Some other programs, I guess, uh, you know, took the scholarships. But anyways, um, yeah, I, I also wanted to ask you regarding your Murray State experience, like how did you end up, you know, going from Bundesliga uh, to to then Murray State? Well, actually, I played Bundesliga while I was at Murray State. I didn't play oh, prior wow. to that. Yeah. So okay. I, what I would do is when I play college tennis, I would um, jump on a plane right away in May as soon as the season ended. And, um, and I would start playing club matches. And I think it was when I, when I played Bundesliga, I think it was like 2000 and 2001. And I was in, my, in college already. Um, but how did I end up at Murray State? See, this is a really crazy story, but I'll tell it anyway. Sure. So I finished high school in Germany, and then I decided that I was going to play just tennis. And I actually, at that point, had decided to travel and, and maybe play some futures. But what happened was is that I needed to, I already said that I had a creation 
um, passport. What happens in Croatia or many countries in, in the world is that you have a mandatory like military service mm. and, or mandatory like civil service. In Germany, they call it Zivildienst, where you have to spend a year of that. You have to, it's mandatory. So in Croatia, I had to do that. And my dad um, tried to get me out of that um, for medical reasons, which were valid. You know, I've always had some some um, medical issues, um, a lot of knee problems and stuff like that. So while he was trying to resolve that, um, I did not have a passport, so and I, I couldn't travel. So that whole year, uh, where I wasn't going to high school, I was just playing tennis. I was traveling from one prize money tournament to the next in Germany, and I hated it. That was like maybe the worst, the worst year tennis wise for me. It was absolutely mm -hmm. awful. I was not happy. I was like, I'm, I don't want to do this. Um, and that was very important for me to realize that. I didn't actually like that lifestyle when I was done with college because that's when I started teaching immediately because look, that lifestyle, while it may, it may appear gl uh, glamorous to some, it's actually a very difficult lifestyle because you're constantly on the move. You're not playing in Monte Carlo and Madrid and Rome. You're at these like little towns in the middle of nowhere. And there's a lot of killing time involved in playing tennis at the at the pro level or at the high level where you, you know you do your practice you do a match but then you have like you know hours upon hours during the day where you have to kill time and a lot of guys they play cards or they play games or whatever but i'm a hyper productive person and mm -hmm. to me it was just boring and unfulfilling and i was miserable so i hated that year and i said i need something i need something i need something different and at that time this was like late 90s like a lot of um my friends who I played against in Germany would go off to college in the United States. And I always was very infatuated with the United States. My favorite tennis players came from the United States, Agassi, Sampras, Connors, McEnroe. Also was a big fan of the American culture, a big fan of hip hop music and um, American movies and all that. And um, I spoke English really well. And I said, I thought, you know what, I'm, I want to go to the United States and play college tennis. I want to do this. And then we started working on that. We started making some contacts and I had very good results. So mm. I had a ton of offers, you know, there wasn't a problem at all. I had tons of offers and um, I had two that were the most interesting to me. One was uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Are you familiar with that school? Yes, and, yes, and, it's cool. And it yeah, at that time, um, Paul Costin was a coach and they were top five in the nation, actually, at that time. And he offered me a full ride, but um, I wasn't going to play number one. I think he, he was going to put me at three or four. And uh, the other school was Murray State, where I talked on the phone with Mel Purcell. And for anybody that knows Mel Purcell, he's an unbelievably charismatic guy that you can just sit there and listen to for hours upon hours. And I was just mesmerized by this guy. But not only that, I'm a huge fan of professional tennis. And as soon as I, as soon as I heard his name, I started digging up some of my old tennis magazines. And I, I was looking and I found that he beat Boris Becker in, uh -huh. Hamburg, in Hamburg on clay in Germany after Boris Becker had won Wimbledon. And I was like, you know what? I have a chance to work with this guy, this guy who was like 20 in the world. <laughs> I don't care where Murray State is. I've never been to the, United, to the United States prior to that. I don't care where it is. I'm going here. And um, the difference between VCU and Murray State is humongous. Like that's a huge, rich program VCU is. And Murray State is a very small program. Both were Division I. Um, but I can tell you that I don't regret that the decision one bit going to Murray State, even though I probably would have had more chances to like maybe develop a higher ranking in the NCAA if I played for a bigger school because I would have been exposed to more uh, super like high ranked matches and stuff like that. I don't regret the decision of going to Murray State one bit because I got to play with Mel Purcell almost every day. We played hundreds of sets. Wow. I, I developed the great friendships. Uh, we had a lot of Europeans on the team. Um, it was 
really the time of my life. I'll never forget that time, and I have no regrets. I think it was a good decision. And I got to play at number one. Um, I got to play at number one my entire college career. Nice. Mel put me at number two only one time. And this was, <laughs> this was a funny story, too, because I was in the gym uh, lifting weights, and I was on, the, on a bench with, uh, with weights. But not the bench press, but the, just the fly weights, right? And you right. know how in a college gym, it's like a mess, right? There's weights on the ground everywhere. Nobody, yeah. nobody racks the weights. It's just a disaster. <laughs> so somebody had left weights on the ground underneath the bench. And as I was done with my set, I, I dropped the weights down and I crushed these two fingers uh, underneath the weight. Okay, I crushed yeah. these two fingers. I, br I break both of them. But this was in the spring, in the middle of the season. I, I'm not missing any matches. So I, go to the tr so I go to the training room and I'm doing all these therapies. And in the, trainer, in the training room, they ended up doing this special tape job on my fingers where they taped these two fingers together. It was almost like they were in a cast. So I basically mm -hmm. kind of held the racket with this finger, this finger, and this finger. And that's how I... This, well, was my second, this was my second year. I played. I mean, I wasn't at my best by any means. So when I... I didn't miss any matches, but the first match after my finger incident, uh, Mel put me at number two and I won that match. And he's like, okay, Nick, you go, you go back to number one. You're fine. Um, wow. But there was that year, there were some other things going on, but there was the, the second year was when I played my worst. I played really well my first, third, and fourth year. I got, uh, was a named player of the year in the Ohio, Ohio Valley Conference. But the second year... A lot of uh, mishaps happened and I, I didn't play as well as I could have. But yeah, that's why, that's the story of how I ended up at Murray State. Uh, really, um, a school that's not that famous, even though we do have now one basketball player that everybody knows, John Morant. You know him? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He played it's for really Murray good. State. He played for yeah, Murray yeah. State, which his, you, you know, his, the stuff that happens with him is not always the most positive news. But anyways, <laughs> like, you know, um, Murray State is a uh, is a very small place with a good basketball team, and it's uh, yeah. I, I, look, it was a great experience. No no regrets whatsoever. That's fantastic, Nick. And um, what is the maybe one big thing that you learned from Coach Purcell while while you were there that you you know took with you? Oh man, there's a lot, but one thing that stands out is uh my reflexes and my volley game. Because when I grew up in Germany, um, I was a baseliner. I never came to the net and I hated playing doubles. I only came to the net to shake hands. And this was back in the servant volley era. So the guys on tour were um, servant volleying. But I think intuitively what I've always known is that I'm not athletically gifted enough to be able to serve in volley because trust me everybody was telling me to serve in volley because that's how you were supposed to play tennis back in those days especially in the winter when we played on indoor carpet if you stayed back coaches would look at you and say what are you doing you're doing it wrong but intuitively i knew that i had no chance if i serve in volley every first and second serve because i'm just not quick enough i'm just not fast enough at the net not agile enough so I was better off at the baseline, like serving big and playing from the baseline. Um, but when I came to college, and this is something that I do like about college tennis is the importance of doubles. I started playing yeah. doubles every day. And uh, I never played uh, that much doubles in my life. I mean, of course, you have doubles in, in the team competitions in Germany as well. But we would never play doubles in practice. We would always play singles. But I started playing sets of doubles every day. And usually against the Mel, who was maybe one of the best doubles players that I've ever seen in my life. And one of the things that he loved to do was to hit us with his volleys. He would poach <laughs> and hit the ball right at us, you know, in the worst places imaginable. And he would start cracking oh, yeah. up and laughing. <laughs> he would just be laughing his ass off. Evil. And so through that, you know, through a lot of bruises and stuff like that, I, I started developing better reflexes. Yeah. So just the fact that I was playing a lot more doubles, I became better at doubles my returns improved my servant volley improved my reflexes improved so when i then would go back to germany in the summertime like my dad would say wow like you are you are so much better at the net you've improved a lot like it was really a big improvement in one year and so that's one thing also 
I will say that my footwork and my court speed improved tremendously when I was in college because I did a lot of work on the track. I used to love to go to the stadium at Murray State and, and do stairs and do uh, work on the track. So awesome. um, the nice thing about there is that you had all these facilities right there. You had the gym. So training was a lot easier than, for example, in Germany, where you would have to go to, you would have to go to the gym. You would have to go to the track to do all this stuff there. Everything was right there. I did a lot more of it. Um, and, um, I improved my footwork a lot. So that's another thing my dad would notice when I would come back from the States. Germany is like, hey, man, you're moving well. You're moving a lot better. So, Yeah, that's awesome, Nick. Um, yeah, similar to you. I mean, when I was a junior, I just all baseline, just trying to hit forehands and whatnot. And so I did, really did not know how to play doubles. I remember, you know, in one of the first scrimmages we had um, in our team, like I was just watching the ball, like go, go whiz by me. And I was like, how am I going to even <laughs> volley these shots? Uh, so, and I didn't, I wasn't really in the lineup that much in doubles, uh, just in singles mainly. Oops, sorry, Mike just dropped. But, um, I guess moving from, from college tennis, which is just such a, a wonderful experience, so uh, lucky that we were able to do it is, um, you know, I want to ask you a bunch of questions about, uh, just club level players because, you know, I play in these USCA leagues and I, I see a lot of, you know, three Oh to five Oh tennis and, and whatnot, um, and uh, first question for you that a lot of, um, you know, players ask me about is like, should they be prioritizing strategy or technique? You know, obviously these players, they have a uh, limited time, you know, they, they um, uh, have jobs and stuff, so they want to train, but they're not sure, like, should I focus on the technique or just forget about that, focus on strategy? So what's your general uh, opinion on that? That is a really a great question. And not now, but. Back in the day, I used to coach a lot of ladies' leagues, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm, gen I'm very against making general, um, you know, statements. But my experience here in Southeast Florida has been that these type of players who are generally between the 3.0 and 3.5 level, maybe 4.0, is that they will look for a shortcut to getting more wins, which means that they're looking for strategy rather than technique. So mm -hmm. they will take a lesson, they will do a clinic to learn some kind of trick, you know, maybe I can lob it this way or move this way or stand that way and doubles to start getting more wins instead of putting in the hard work and improving the technique that's going to take a lot of repetitions. It's going to be a very painful process. So I think often players at the 3035 level are thinking of strategy in tennis as a quick fix to uh, more wins. But as a general statement, I think um, recreational players think too much about strategy and tactics. And they will often be too concerned also with their opponent. What happens on the other side of the net where 99% of the problems is are happening on their side of the court, which is usually their technique. There's some huge flaw. Maybe they have a terrible second serve. Maybe they don't have a backhand. Maybe they don't have a proper forehand. And um, strategy is going to be irrelevant if you have technical yeah. flaws because whatever you're strategizing to do, you can't execute anyway. So okay. technique at the recreational level is at the, of the utmost importance and that's something that players should spend most of their time working on. And when we're talking about strategy and tactics, it's not some super complicated, convoluted way of playing tennis. Uh, you want to keep things as simple as possible and not concern yourself too much with it. But I understand that, you know, recreational players are in the game for different reasons. And that's why I brought up ladies tennis. Because often for them, it's like the team atmosphere and they want to get the win for the team and it's a social thing. So it's a little bit different from maybe somebody who's like a, maybe a male player who plays on a ladder somewhere and is trying to get from like 4-0 to 4-5. Maybe that's a little bit different there. So it depends on the individual. It depends on the circumstance. It might even depend on the location. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, technique is 
the most important thing at the recreational level. And this is why I cover it so much um, on my YouTube channel. I think it's very important. Yeah, thanks for that, Nick. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the ceiling is is very limited. Uh, oh, you know, more limited depending on on your technique uh, proficiency, and uh, it's something that I've been <laughs> constantly working on. I enjoy putting the the hard work in, but uh, it it can be can be very tough. So, speaking of that, um, Nick, what do you think the key is to developing fundamentally? sound technique especially like when you have like club level players like like you mentioned you know they're playing the, a lot of matches and this and that they're thinking about like winning uh, more so than improving technique so what's the key to developing that that proper technique it's not easy because let's just say that i'm working with someone on uh, improving any technical aspect of the the serve okay and they go out right after the lesson that we had and to play a match, yeah. none of the things that I taught them will be, for, be there for them in a match. So they have to do a tremendous amount of repetitions un until that's available for them in a match, whatever it is that they were working on. So it, we're talking about muscle memory. We're talking about reps that are going to allow you to play tennis without having to think about technique. Because once you start... You know, playing tennis and you're overthinking technique, you got all this stuff going on in your head. And especially if you're trying to play matches, it's going to be extremely difficult. So you're most likely not going to do it and you're going to revert back to your muscle memory. But the big question mark is, what is the muscle memory? For most players, it's probably still the old game. So again, that's where the hard work comes in, the right way to work, doing the correct stroke over and over and over again thousands of times, tens of thousands of times, and I've seen it work. It does work, okay? This is a method that works. You hit a stroke the correct way 10,000 times. You're going to start getting confidence in that stroke. You're going to start accelerating faster and faster, and one day you're going to step on that match court, and that stroke will be there for you. You're not going to have to think about it at all. It's going to be automated. I know this sounds kind of crazy to some people, but it is the absolute truth. This is how junior players develop. And um, this is what the recreational players have to do. They have to put in the work. Otherwise, forget it. If you don't put in the reps, you're just going to stagnate. You're going to play the same way you always have. Yeah, yeah. It's about, you know, what you did uh, from a young age. And yeah, you know, there was a period uh, I remember where I was well, waking up uh, somewhat early, at least, and, and every morning, you know, practicing my serve because I had a, a issue with a racket drop. And I was actually, you know, improving. But then there was a period where, you know, I, I stopped doing that. And then when I was serving, then regressed again. So it really just, I want to just highlight, you know, how important the consistency is. You know, that saying where if you improve 1% each day, then, you know, you'll have improved like 37 times uh, by the end of one year, things like that. So, right. um, yeah, just a very important message. And then, uh, so I guess going back to like the issues with like, like playing matches, would you suggest if somebody is making a big technical change should they complete you know should they stop playing matches or is it still okay that where you know they're doing a ton of practicing a ton of reps and they'll play the match maybe a little bit regression if it's a it like a, a, a critical points or something and then they go back to practicing and then it'll eventually get better like what what do you think uh, is best well matches are important because they're the ultimate test so you do want to test yourself and see where you're at and ideally record yourself so you can see it as well yeah. But I always tell this story of when I used to coach high-level juniors down here in uh, Southeast Florida. And something that I would see very often was I would train Monday to Friday with the juniors and they would be doing really well. Then they would go off and play a ton of matches at a tournament over the weekend. And they would come back either Monday or Tuesday and they'd be playing worse. Hmm. And what... I attribute that to is the fact that their muscle memory wasn't set yet. They were still playing tennis their old way, their intuitive way. So when that happens, it's kind of a difficult thing because some kids or some recreational players really thrive on match play. They enjoy the social aspect of playing tournaments and being in that, in that atmosphere. So you don't necessarily want to deprive someone from that, but... I do think that if players are aware that this can 
stagnate their game, maybe reduce it a little bit. Or if somebody doesn't care, then, you know, reduce it completely and don't play any tournaments for like a month, let's say, and just put a block of training for one month and let's just see what happens in a month. You know, you can accomplish a lot in a month. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a complicated thing. It depends on the individual. Excuse me. So I'm being bombarded over here. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Um, it depends on the individual. And um, it's, it's hard to make that choice because, see, the, the tricky thing is, like, if you um, tell a kid who loves playing tournaments and thrives on playing tournaments, we're not playing any tournaments for two months, that could actually make the kid worse. And the kid might lose motivation and might lose the passion for the game. So we have to be very careful. But the simple answer to your question is yes, 100%. You play a ton of matches the wrong way, you're only going to further ingrain the old muscle memory. And the new muscle memory is not going to have any chance to kick in. So, so within that truth, you have to find a way around it to make it work for each individual player. Yeah, yeah, and no, I definitely agree with that. Um, so... In terms of you were talking about the serve a bit, uh, I really just want to dig into that a bit because it's, you know, everybody, I was just going on like a Reddit tennis forum the other day and like all the questions are about serves and that's usually what you get. So, and you have a lot of great videos on that, uh, obviously, which everyone should check out on your YouTube channel, but a uh, few questions about technique on the serve. So I guess, first off, what is the biggest power leak in, in your experience that you've seen on the serve that people make uh, that mistake? Or if there's a couple, let's see, you know, you could... The <laughs> biggest power leak. Yeah. The biggest mistake, you think? I would say, like, if I just take myself as an example, and this is an easy experiment that everybody can do. So some people say, like, you know, if you don't use the lower half of your body, is the biggest power leak. So I did make a video where I served from a chair. Was there a power leak? Yeah. Yes. But did it feel like a huge one? Not really. I was still able to swing super fast. Okay, then you could say, oh, what about rotation? Um, what if you don't rotate, if you just stay sideways and you just completely lock your arm and, and try to go hard forward? Um, what would happen then? And um, that, that, does that take power away? Absolutely, it does take power away. That's the reason why the kick serve is the slowest serve out of them all because it doesn't involve a lot of rotation. Um, but it's not that big. Right? It doesn't feel like a huge power loss. Then you can say, okay, what about the vertical lift, right? Like the cartwheel and all that. So I did a video on that where I blocked my cartwheel. And it did feel a little bit more of a power leak than the other two things I mentioned. It did, but still, I could still rip it pretty hard. Mm. So to me, like what will take power away the most if you break the momentum of the racket. So if you get rid of the loop of the racket, mm. where the racket comes in, out, up. When you get rid of that, in other words, if you serve with a waiter serve, so if I force myself, which by the way, is extremely difficult. I've tried many times to serve with a waiter serve. I can't, my racket just drops no matter what, but I had to force myself to serve with a waiter serve. And that to me does feel like the most significant power loss. When you cut off the racket's path and you lose that range of motion, that to me felt the worst felt like the biggest power loss and i think that would be probably the answer to your question so anybody that serves a waiter serve or anybody that has an insufficient racket drop should do a tremendous amount of work on the serve trying to improve that because i don't think that you will ever be able to maximize your serve if you have those two technical flaws and if you take a look at the high level you will not find anyone except madison brangle who suffers from a chronic shoulder injury that doesn't have a full racket drop. There's another player actually in doubles. I forget the name now. But so there's maybe a couple of players on tour um, that don't have a proper racket drop because of shoulder problems. But you're not going to find anybody at the high level without a full racket drop. So to me, you talk about the biggest power leak, uh, that would probably be it. Gotcha, Nick. And, and you know, it's it's interesting um, for me because, you know, I've, as I mentioned, I played college tennis, play 5-0 leagues right now. But 
the racket drop is actually something that I've noticed, you know, filming myself, like you suggested, and I noticed that it's a, a bit shallow. So I wanted to ask you. So where does your, where does your racket, where does your racket drop exactly? If you like at the, at its deepest point, where is it aligned, aligned with your back? It's probably only a little bit tilted down from my shoulder, which is like crazy to think about, like that so, it's that shallow. So but, wait, so yeah. it's not in the middle of your back. It's above the middle of your back. Uh, oh no, it's probably like, mm, like the deepest, like p- the deepest, if I looked at your racket and you, sh- you had your back turned towards me, where yeah. would the tip of the racket be aligned with your back? Would it be on your lower back, your middle back, or would it be somewhere where your shoulders are? It's actually around where my shoulders are, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have a Maybe. shallow racket drop. Yeah. 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 It's okay. You know, so it's, yeah, sorry. Good. So, so sometimes. And this is something that I cover on my website, intuitivetennis.com. I have a whole collection of videos where I cover problems at the rec level. And it's all, you know, organized by different strokes, a serve, forehand, backhand, whatever. And it's funny. One of the videos that I recently made was, um, and this is all from my case studies on the court over the last 30 years of coaching, is that the uh, way to serve or insufficient record drop could have many causes. But one of the causes could be an early toss arm drop. So if you are dropping the toss arm consciously Mm. and possibly too early, that can bring the right side of your body up too early and then the racket Mm. can't really drop properly. So that's what I found with some of the more high level players at the the rec level, like more higher level rec players that don't have a good racket drop is that I've seen that issue where at the lower Rack level, it's mostly out of the problem. It's like a forehand grip, or it's just it's a completely different different uh, story there. But um, see, if you do have this problem and it's a chronic one, which uh, which yeah. I'm assuming it is, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There there is a way to recalibrate a racket drop and, and and do some exercises where you force yourself to start from a lower place. And again, it's a it's a matter of of reps and uh, it's a matter of building that new muscle memory and getting comfortable with it and um identifying what's causing the racket drop exactly that that's going to be the most helpful thing when you figure out why it is that you are shallowing out your racket drop you know yeah thanks Zach. yeah this is a really interesting study case you know because like for again for example like my forehand you know it's very free flowing like whippy things like that but then like on the serve like i don't know it might be a combination of things but also i think i've had just so many reps where like you know i'm thinking like i second serve like want to get it in things like that so i'm like you know kind of swinging more with my arm a bit and then not coordinating like that because you know rick macy is saying obviously that you want to time the uh pushing up of your legs with the racket drop um, and you know, well, that's true you know, because the opposite of that would be a, a racket drop leak. So if you get into the racket drop yeah. prior to see, I don't teach pushing of the legs. This is where my okay. methodology differs from, from Macy's, but I call this more a straightening of the entire body. It's not really a jump. The entire body straightens. Mm. But if you look at the legs, like when the knees start to straighten, that's when you start unloading. And mm. if you see that the racket's already in the racket drop prior to that happening with your knees, you have a racket drop leak, yeah. which is not necessarily correlated with a shallow racket drop um, because you'll see a racket drop leak even at uh, WT, on the W, not so much on the ATP, but you'll see it on the WTA tour, even the very highly ranked players. Um, but let me ask you a more specific question. So you're saying that you are not really trusting your second serve. So is there a difference in racket drop? depth between your first and second serve uh i'm trying to remember the videos i've been watching myself uh i think there's a little bit more of a drop for the second serve than my first serve a little bit more of a drop on the second serve than the first serve which makes absolutely no sense right because you said that you're you're hitting the second serve slower so yeah. there is something going on in that first serve that it's, I mean, it's hard for me to tell without seeing it, but there's something going on there. Something's causing that shallowing out. It's just a yeah. matter of identifying what it is. Yeah. Yeah. We might have to do a, a Zoom consultation, <laughs> Nick, which, which you do. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah. Just send me a clip. Yeah. I'll take a look at it. I'll take a look at yeah. it. Maybe, you know, I'll do a tremendous amount of video analysis. Uh, 
Yeah. On a daily basis. Uh, so yeah, it's a, I take my time with it too, because it's not so easy. Video analysis is very difficult. Um, but, um, I can take a look at it and yeah. see what, if I can find something. Yeah. No, thanks, Nick. Uh, definitely. We'll set that up. Um, yeah. And then, um, so in terms of, um, toss techniques, obviously this is another thing that you see a lot and, and then, um, you know, club level players, even if it's in a bad position, like they're trying to hit a first serve and it's like way to the left, they might still hit it, you know, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if, if, uh, if there's any particular toss tip that you'd like to give that, you know, maybe would cover a good cross section of the general club level player population that could help them with their toss. Look, unfortunately the toss is one of the most com complex movements in tennis. In fact, it is so complex that even elite level players struggle with it. Now think about that elite level players struggle with the toss. So don't be surprised that a lot of rec level players struggle with the toss. I struggle with my toss sometimes, and it's a constant battle because you're not guaranteed to have a perfect toss every time. It's a constant battle. One of the most difficult things about the toss is the fact that you are doing two separate actions with your left hand and your right hand. I compare this to a non-musician trying to drum. So I'm, I'm a non-musician, and if I try to play one beat with my right hand and play a separate beat with my left hand at the same time, see, I can't even do it now. See, I can't do it <laughs> because I, I, I can't do it. But on the serve, it's very similar where you're doing one movement with the left while doing another movement with the right. And this is where recreational players get messed up. That is probably the most common error at the lowest recreational level is the sinking of the arms, where usually they are wild in the very beginning portion of that movement and they have absolutely no control over that toss. So the sink is the biggest issue. As we get into the more advanced recreational levels, we're going to see more intricate problems, toss release, toss tempo, um, toss arm structure, uh, toss arm positioning uh, prior to the release, toss arm positioning after the release, um, hand positioning, at the release um, and after the release, how are you placing the ball uh, in your hand? It gets very complicated and it gets very complex when we get to more uh, advanced recreational players. But if, if you're asking me like, what, what do general lower level rec players do wrong in the toss? They're just simply too wild and they have absolutely no control over the toss. Yeah, it makes sense there, Nick. Um, so, you know, obviously the synchronization of the arms is tough. Um, would you recommend players to have, um, you know, such a take back where like they just put their their um, racket uh, in the trophy position just like pretty much immediately and then now they have like their other tossing arm or do you think that's like a limiting sort of, uh, you know, technique? Well, it's a limiting technique, absolutely, but it can be a really good progression. So in other words, okay. if you start from the trophy position, which is something that I do with, you know, beginners when they, when they serve, I start them from the trophy. Um, you, I think he, you could do that on your normal, um, complete serve, if you will, but you would be missing out on the racket's momentum. You would be completely cutting that off and there's no reason to do that. I know there's some pros that do that, but there's absolutely no benefit to it. It might work if you have a lightning fast arm, but most players are going to find a decrease in power when they get rid of the flow and the rhythm and the continuity of the racket building its own momentum on its way up. So while that is a good progression in the beginning, what I think can help with the difficulty of synchronizing the non-dominant arm with the dominant arm would be compartmentalizing the serve. And what works with a lot of players is that when they can separate the actions of tossing and taking the racket back, makes a big difference. So with my student, Anna, um, somebody that I taught from scratch, if you take a look at those videos, how I built her serve, I just had her start in the lag position with the racket and just work on the toss. So now she's only focused on the toss. Once that ball is released, now she focuses on bringing the other arm up. Mm. And now it's a motion that's compartmentalized and it's a lot easier. And Nick, uh, in terms of the stance, I know there's like, 
big debates and and whatnot, like for the service yeah. sense, but platform versus pinpoint versus like some sort of hybrid. Uh, just maybe like general thoughts to guide people who maybe they're you know three out of four or five and they're just not not really even sure like which one should I do. Man, that's a, it's so funny you asked that because I just made a video about this. It's the ultimate stance guide. It's coming awesome. out very soon on the Intuitive Tennis YouTube channel. So excellent. this is a great question because when we're talking about, let's say, beginners or maybe even intermediates, if you try to teach them a pinpoint stance, it's going to give the players a lot of difficulty because they have enough to worry about. And timing that back foot coming in it just adds too much movement and they can't do it anyway and it just gets too complicated. So for the, lo for the lower recreational level side, I recommend the platform stance. But I also recommend to experiment with stances because there's no right or wrong when it comes to stances. I get into more depth about this uh, in my video. Um, you can always experiment with stances and find the one that works best for you. There's no right or wrong, however... Lower rec levels, start with a platform, and then maybe when you get better, you can you can experiment with a pinpoint. Gotcha, gotcha, thanks. Also, yeah, makes, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry to no, cut you off, but but, but in this video, like within the stances, there's many, many different variations, and I go into depth um, in this video about like what variation to use and so on, because it can get quite complex. And it also, there's variation between like stances serving from to the do side and the ad side, it gets quite complex, um, but yeah. It, mm. Keep things simple for rec players, you know, start with the platform and, and, and go from there. But I think this video is going to be very helpful for that. I'll go into like extreme de depth and detail and give more specific advice. Love it. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to, to watching that one. Uh, it's interesting, you know, it might maybe because I have a like on my left, my left leg has a, I've had like little like knocks on it, um, like a knee thing, but I'm still able to play. But uh, for some reason, I feel like I'm able to explode a bit more when I when I use pinpoint than when I'm like when I'm on platform. Sometimes I feel like I can't consciously like put like more weight on the back foot, or sometimes I'll forget. But like if I do pinpoint, like I can I know like when I step, I can just really put more weight on the back foot uh, to start. And then so I don't know. It's interesting. So I guess maybe obviously like you said, you know, you want to experiment a bit but you know if you're a lower level just platform yes. just simplify because yeah the rhythm like with the <laughs> tossing and, and stepping up is not easy uh so it's hard so. it's hard yeah i mean yeah. there's going to be um it's going to be an advantage um to do pinpoint if you can pull it off as far as forward momentum and i this is another thing i discussed mm. in more detail in this video that's coming out um nice. but yeah so pinpoint okay. stance uh, look both stances are correct. It's just a matter of what works for you. Like personally, I can't do pinpoint at all. It doesn't mean mm. that pinpoint is bad. It's just for me, it's not right. Right. I prefer platform. I have experimented, but I can only do platform. When I do pinpoint, I just can't, I just can't time it right. I can't load it right. Sure. I don't put any weight on my back foot when I do pinpoint. It's just like, mm. like the, it's, it's like John Isner style or some of the, where it's like just the tip of the, uh, of the, of the back foot. And it just feels like, like there's too much pressure on my front leg and that's where my knee is messed up. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's, it gets, for that reason, um, the pinpoint has never worked out for me and the timing of it, I found extremely challenging. So for me, platform works and, um, yeah, I'll be sticking with that one, but it doesn't yeah. mean, this doesn't mean anything for anybody else listening because you got to go through the same process of testing things out and you'll feel it. You'll feel you know, like in tennis, you'll feel it when it's right. Like, for example, that's how Roddick discovered his serve. Nobody taught him that. He was just goofing off. He was joking around and served like that. And it was like, wow, okay, this kind of works. And he just kept doing it. And that's how he developed that that serve technique. That's quite unorthodox. But yeah, you got to experiment and you'll feel it when it's right. Yeah, definitely. Everyone, Everyone's different. Um, so another thing, um, you know, big aspect that I think is pretty underrated is, uh, is the footwork. Cause a lot of players obviously like say, you say that you see them where they miss a ball and they just like immediately like look at, looking at their swing, but then you can, if you're watching closely, you realize maybe like they just, their footwork wasn't there. They weren't in position. So I guess any, um, tips for players who maybe they either, they watch themselves and they notice, wow, I move pretty inefficiently, or maybe they just like, know. uh, we could use the word intuitively that, that they're not moving like well like how do you think they should go about improving their footwork 
So, if you want to talk about the biggest difference between the rec level and the high level, most people will say it's the technique, but it's actually the footwork. Mm. And there's a big difference between footwork and speed. And most people associate footwork with speed. And those two, those two things have nothing in common with each other. So footwork is your ability to set the ball up properly with your feet. And what that also entails is ball recognition. And that is a huge problem at the recreational level where players don't have good enough ball recognition. Ball recognition. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, players at the rec level don't play with the right amount of intensity. Partially due to the fact that the ball is coming slower, so they're not forced to have intensity. Where on the high level, if you don't have intensity, you're not playing at the high level. You have absolutely no chance. So you either play with intensity or you don't play at all because the game is just too quick. So you have to play with intensity. So these are the reasons why rec players look the way they look compared to the high level. They Their feet don't move the same way. So... How do you improve intensity? That's something that you can force yourself to do. Um, sometimes that can be difficult if it's not, if it doesn't come to you naturally because um, it could be something that you're born with, you know, something like having a lot of intensity, having that willingness to move your feet all the time and fight. It's something that some players are born with, but that's something that you can't force and can improve, no doubt about it. But ball recognition is unfortunately something that is extremely difficult to teach. So let me give you an example. Let's say like a rec player with low intensity is standing on the baseline and just waiting for the ball to come. Maybe they're hopping around a little bit, you know. And um, the other person hits like a thin a spin on the forehand and the, where the ball is going to land inside the service line. Now, the rec player will not read that early enough. They will observe the ball and be unable to gather enough information about this ball. By the time they see where the ball is, it's going to be too late. They're going to be scrambling up and they're going to be forced to do an emergency shot where at the high level, players have excellent ball recognition and they can read Mm -hmm. the ball very early. They see it flying and they read it and they make adjustments much earlier and they don't get caught uh, with balls like that. So, How do you develop that? Well, it's a matter of allowing yourself to be able to recognize the ball properly by being intense and ready. That's number one. And number two, just having experience and seeing as many balls as possible Mm -hmm. under the right circumstances and your ball recognition will improve. So those two things are going to be the most important things when it comes to footwork. Um, It's going to be intensity and ball recognition. And that's what a lot of recreational players lack, and that's what they look the way they look. And no footwork drill, no exercise will do anything for you unless you solve these two problems. If you go to any club in the United States and you take a glance across the courts and you see people playing doubles, you see that they're... A lot of them are standing still in place. And then when the ball goes in a, away from them, they move, of course. But they're standing in place. And you go to any academy in the United States, high-level junior players, you see they're on their feet bouncing around, right? So that's the biggest difference is that recreational players lack intensity. And without intensity, you can forget the other things that I talked about. You can forget ball recognition if you don't have intensity because even if you do recognize the ball properly, but you don't have to, the red you don't have the intensity and the readiness to go to the ball. It doesn't matter the fact that you recognize it. So those two things go hand in hand. And uh, it's a, it's a very long process to develop this. If it's ever developed, some players just can't. Um, And yeah, that's, it is what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Intensity and recognition. Yeah. I I can just say, I agree hundred percent. I've many experiences. This came to mind um, with those points. So, in terms of strategy that, that you mentioned briefly, Nick, um, I guess maybe what are just a couple simple strategies that that we can just take to pretty much every match that that's you know basic but um, you know easily um, executable that'll help us. Look, it's going to be different from every player because every player is going to have different uh, qualities, and the yeah. strategies are going to be it's going to be different. So it's going to be very difficult to make these general strategies. Um, 
not only because players are different, because the opponents are going to be different as well. So maybe one player um, strategy should be to keep the ball in play and play everything at 50 to 60% power level and it's going to be enough to win the match. Mm-hmm. But that might not necessarily be correct for another player. Uh, so it, dep- right. it depends. It really depends. Maybe one player should come to the net as often as possible, but that might not be the correct advice for another player who maybe has mobility issues and can't volley. So it's very difficult to give general strategic advice. It has to be tailored to the individual player. And not only that, but also to the opponent as well. While there is a little bit more room for flexibility there where you can have a general um, strategy that's going to work best for the individual player and then making small adjustments depending on who you play. Yeah, yeah, it's such a big, um, you know, just using your, your head and, and being a problem solver and kind of considering like your strengths and weaknesses against the other uh, opponents, strengths and weaknesses. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll just give you one like concrete example. Um, let's say you've got, you got a 4-0 match and um, your play style is a little bit more like aggressive baseliner. And then you're playing against somebody who is just, just um, yeah, I know some people don't like the term pusher, but yeah, I'm trying to, I'm forgetting another (laughs) word for it, but yeah, basically playing somebody who's just like slices and dices, doesn't have pace, gets every ball in, um, you know, how about like against those sorts of players, any like a couple strategies you might want to employ against them? Cause that's comes up often, I think. Yeah. Dinkers, I think is another word, right? Oh, a good one. I'll use it. (laughs) Dinkers. Listen, this is like, it's going to be one of those categories where it's easier said than done because let's talk about why why dinkers pushers do so well at that level because one of the power sources in tennis is the pace of the incoming ball so when you don't have the pace you have to swing faster what happens when you swing faster and also you have technical deficiencies is that the chance of missing increases drastically Mm -hmm. okay so you understand the problem right there with just what I said there. You play against a pusher who gives you no pace and you have technical deficiencies. Now, you can push with them and just dink it in and play for you know three hours. That way, you're probably not going to do that. So you're going to swing fast. And if you have technical deficiencies and you swing fast, you, there's no chance you're going to win. You're going to make one mistake after another. People say, come to the net. No, well, how are you going to make it to the net? You know, you got to make it to the net with, with strokes, right? You can't just start at the net. You got to make it up there first. So um, that's just one example of why it's so tricky to beat a pusher. It's very complex. Um, I, again, the one tip that I can give everyone when it comes to pushers is to play against them more because a lot of people avoid them. Yeah. So you play against them more, you, you're going to get better at, at playing against that type of game style and then work on your technique. You know, another super big problem area is the half court in tennis. There's a lot of people don't spend enough time working on it. So if you don't ever work on your half court game and you're just rallying forehand cross courts from the baseline, then you play against a pusher who gives you a lot of dink shots in the half court. You come up there and you're making a mess. Of course, you're going to make a mess because you don't practice that part of course. So include that into your practice sessions. Um, a lot of people played, hate playing high balls, right? They love uh, playing against the ball machine or rallying where everything is around their waist and their strike zone between the waist and the, the chest. Everything feels great. They never practice high balls and they come to the court and they against a pusher who gives them a little bit more of a moon volley ball. And all of a sudden they start complaining, oh my God, this is awful. Everything's <laughs> too high. And. Well, of course, the, what do you want me to give you like some kind of a shortcut against that? I can't because you're the one that messed up. You didn't practice high ball. So spend every practice working on half court, spend every practice working on returning dink serves, spend every practice, re- you know, playing against moon balls. When you do that and then also practice a lot playing matches against pushers, you're going to see improvements and you're going to be able to do something that's done at the high level where pushers get blown off the court. But if you are at the lower recreational level, you don't have the qualities to be able to blow a pusher off the court. And this is why pushers always have 
and always will have dominance over the rec level. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. So that, that's, there's no shortcuts to that. You got to put in the hard work, get your level up so you can eventually blow them off the court or it's going to continue to be a problem. Yeah, most definitely. Nick, uh, wow. T- time flies. I, I, I'm confident I could talk to you f- uh, about tennis and interview for like six, seven hours. No problem. But <laughs> you know, I guess, uh, don't want to take a huge amount of time uh, in your day, but I do want to ask you about intuitive tennis. Um, uh, may, I'm interested about what motivated you to create intuitive tennis or how did it come about? And then obviously, you know, information on, uh, how we can check it out. Uh, that's a great question. And, um, man, it's such a long story. I could talk about this for an hour, but I'm going to try to summarize it as much as I can. So I already mentioned in the beginning that I created the intuitive tennis methodology. And initially yeah. I wanted to write a book, which I did start writing, um, and then I decided that it's going to be a lot easier to present that information in video format. Uh, I still might write, write a book one day. I definitely want to do that. But at that particular moment in time, this was 2018, I said, you know what? Let me uh, just present this information in video format. And man, that was really bad in the beginning. Like I was so bad in front of the camera. I was awful. And it took me a while to get get comfortable there. But um, yeah, that's a, it wasn't really... Um, it was something that kind of happened accidentally. Mm, it just wow. was initially a plan to do something complete different. And then it was a kind of like a plan B, so to speak. Yeah. Because after I created my methodology and I implemented it and I had great success with high-level juniors, it was the parents of the juniors that convinced me to put this information out into the world. Mm. And this whole thing kind of coincided with my dad getting diagnosed that with the uh, with uh, terminal lung cancer in 2017 yeah. and he was a great coach and I thought you know what like he has so much great information he never wrote a book he never made videos he's going to take all that stuff to the grave with him I don't want to be like that I think these people are right uh, these people believe that I have incredible information that can benefit so many players across the globe they convinced me to put this information out there and the fact that it turned into a YouTube channel it was more accidental than anything else now interestingly i do uh enjoy making videos a lot i've always made videos but it was never in front of the camera it was always behind the camera so Mm. this whole thing kind of sparked a passion of mine that was kind of hidden that i always had i always had a camcorder Uh, my dad had a big camcorder i had a camcorder in college and i was always making movies Mm -hmm. so um yeah, so this is um, kind of a weird thing the way it turned out, but that uh, created a, it created another whole other passion, which is uh, you know making videos, combined with trying to teach my methodology, and I also have two other YouTube channels that are not that are um, that I don't really promote, but I they have nothing to do with tennis. They're completely you want to shout them out. No, no, no. You sure? <laughs> not yet. I'm not ready <laughs> okay, yet. Okay. I'm not ready yet. Okay. Maybe, maybe, Let me know. Uh, <laughs> maybe next year this is still incognito okay, okay. but uh Sweet. i have two other youtube channels so this is a big big passion of mine and i love doing it um nice. and so i have this i also am on all platforms so you just go anywhere you're going to find intuitive tennis tiktok facebook instagram youtube I also have a second youtube channel called intuitive tennis 24 uh, 7 where i post a lot of shorter form content and so People can subscribe to that too. And I also have something that I really, really love, which is my own platform. It's my membership site, which is called Intuitive Tennis Premium. This is available on the App Store and the Android Store. All you got to do is type in Intuitive Tennis and there's a seven-day free trial. It's only $14.99 a month after that. And this is the greatest thing I've ever created. I mean, I just added a feature yesterday where... Um, I'm going to be posting a lot of my matches there and my students can post their matches and we can create a community where we're watching these matches and trying to, you know, um, help players with match, match play with tips. And also by posting these matches, we'll have, um, comparisons. We can see, um, uh, improvement in a player watching a match from a year ago to a year later and see if there was any improvements. And there's so many other aspects to my membership side. Like I said, there's courses on there there are um, different menus Uh, one of them is the intuitive zone where i talk about 
the more intricate details of stroke. We talk about your racket drop. Like I have a whole section nice. in there where you can recalibrate your racket drop. I also have problems at the rec level where players can find pretty much any technical problem um, on any stroke in tennis and a solution on how to fix it. Um, there's also long form uh, content, vlog style, where I do some documentaries. I did a nutrition wow. documentary on there. So I, this is like another passion of mine, this website. I really love it. It's a beautiful design. Um, and I'm putting a lot of content on there where I have the freedom to put any type of content that I want, where I'm a little bit more restricted on YouTube. I can't really do whatever I want. I have to be more careful. But there I can pretty much do whatever I want. I have the ultimate freedom, the ultimate control. And it's something that I want to build. And um, yeah, it's available at intuitivetennis.com um, on, the, on the web or you can get it on the, on the app stores. Sweet. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, you're doing a lot of great stuff here. And we're definitely will include all the links that you mentioned, Nick, uh, in the show notes. So uh, thank in, you. In thank you. App. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. No problem. Um, yeah. Wow. So <laughs> you hit an hour and a half. Nick, uh, it's really been uh, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I hope we can uh, do it again soon. Hopefully, uh, when you release that book, my man, we can do one <laughs> as well. Oh, um, you know what? So. That's going to be like. <laughs> are you you still gonna be doing this 10 years from now because i don't know i don't know what i'm gonna Maybe. be ready to start the book the book is a pain <laughs> in the butt i think i need yeah. a ghost writer or something because it's so hard to write mm. a book you know it's so time consuming so it'll be a while yeah. for the book but i don't want to do it yeah. one day <laughs> yeah definitely man it'll, but it it'll was really fun. nice to meet you it was really nice to meet you and um yeah thanks for having me on i appreciate it yeah, anytime, Nick. Uh, pleasure. All the best with you. And again, everybody check out Intuitive Tennis on the various platforms. And uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. All right, man. Nice to meet you. Take care. You too. All right, bye-bye. 